Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. I'm going to talk about Clojure Core Async, which is an, uh, an implementation of CSP style channels for Clojure. Um, and along the way, actually, just talk more about um, channels and their use for solving these kinds of problems and contrast them with some other solutions. So the first thing is to enumerate what the problems are that we're trying to address whenever we do anything. And in this case, I think there are two, um, which may not make sense from looking at the slide as it stands, but it hopefully will as we go forward. And the first is that function call chains make for poor machines. And um, recently and during the talk earlier, I, I tried to contrast the part of your program that's a machine from the part of your program that's um, information. And uh, certainly, there's a, there's a part of most programs that need to convey stuff around, which is certainly a mechanical-like activity. And um, uh, we end up with these callback APIs often to do this stuff. And um, that is a chain of calls that ends up doing the job of conveying things around uh, quite poorly. Um, but the other problem we have is a lot of real-world APIs expose the endpoint to something like I.O. via a callback API. So it's, it's something we encounter and have to address. So the premises here is that, uh, are that um, there comes a time in all good programs when we need to keep things separate and we need to isolate things beyond um, the kinds of isolation we can do with calling. And in fact, we want to isolate ourselves from call sequences. Um, that you're going to start using queues inside your architecture so that the producer of some information and the consumer of some information know nothing about each other, like completely nothing about each other. And all the encapsulating ways that we have that involve ch uh, chains of function calls um, fail to do that at some point. Um, and you can tell they fail to do it because you won't be able to move things to other places. Um, or you'll have some build dependency. That's where this stuff will appear. So what we want to do is raise up conveyance, the part of your application that says, I have something over here, it's going to produce some information, and that should be the end of what it knows. It's going to put it on the end of a conveyor belt, and uh, someone else is going to come and pick that stuff up and do the next thing with it, and never the twain shall meet. Um, we want that to be a first class thing. Um, and so I think what happens in most architectures, whether it's in process or across processes, is that you start introducing queues because queues are a representation of this stuff. So we're going to have processes, and we're going to have queues or channels. Um, now, if you're using Java, you know we already have queues. right? There's Java util concurrent queues. Um, and, but there are a couple of problems with using them in practice, one of which is that they coordinate via um, thread control. In other words, they block actual threads, um, which means that you have to park a real thread on the end of a queue in order to utilize it. Um, Another problem we have is if we want to try this uh, to apply some solution both uh, on the JVM and in the browser in places where JavaScript runs, we don't even have threads there. So we need something other than this. Um, now, of course, if threads were free, that problem on the JVM wouldn't necessarily be a problem. But they're not free. Um, they certainly have stack size uh, associated with them, which can become a problem when you have a lot of threads, um, which is an efficiency problem for an individual server. Um, and there are also a cost involved in waking up threads and, and getting them to execute work on your behalf. Um, so that's why we can't afford to use threads often. So queues are good. Job util concurrent queues don't always apply. Um, and there are specialized queues that do a much, much better job for very particular kinds of scenarios, um, which I'm sure Martin would tell you all about. Um, so if we look at the, the situation we're in, we're facing events and callbacks, right? And what do we see when we address events and callbacks? We often see something like listenable futures or promises. And what happens is you, you know, chain these things together, and you end up with a, a web of direct connected relationships. And it's very difficult to reason about control and flow in a program where all of your logic has been separated into little, when this is clicked, do this. And when this message comes in, do that. And when this is this, this, do that. And the big picture about what your program is about is broken up into splinters and situated in all these uh, callback handlers. So the logic is fragmented. Um, and the vernacular term for that is callback hell. Right? Anybody who's worked with a system that has a lot of callbacks knows 
um, this is a big problem. There are also um, composi compositional problems associated with callback handlers. Um, and something like Rx um, and observables do help with that. They do help you, for instance, build transformation pipelines that are connected to callbacks. Um, but they don't do everything. Um, so there's a lot of problems with this kind of uh, chain of callback handlers. And no matter what kind of wrapping you put around it, the visibility of which uh, handlers are in play, monitoring that, um, control, what's going to run on what thread, right? So I'm calling you back. Is that on my thread? Is it on your thread? You know, how many people have ever done something with callbacks and there was an admonition? Uh, I'm going to call you back, but don't do too much work. Don't do too much work in the handler, okay? Um, that's a sign of a problem. So, so one of the problems with this is that we're starting to, w when you do this, when you build a set of, of uh, call chains uh, connected together, you're using that call chain as if it were a machine, handing off one function calls another function calls another function calls another function, right? And they're passing it along. Um, and what invariably happens is because your logic is fragmented, right? It's in two pieces. One is associated with one callback handler and one is associated with another. And especially if there's conveyance, that is to say, when you're told about something happening, you have to tell somebody else about something, right? So you're, you're shoveling something through, maybe with a transformation in the middle. Um, as soon as you've fragmented your logic, if you have any state at all, like, am I interested in this message? Can I accept it right now? Should I send, you know, who should I send it to? Who's the list of people who care? Right? If there's any state associated with the decision-making process in your split-apart logic, you have to put it somewhere and use shared state to do it. Right? So this handler goes and says, look in the shared thingy and make a decision local for this handler. Another handler says, look in the shared thingy and put something there, and then go back. Um, so you're, buying in, you're forced into shared state when you do this. Uh, and now, of course, people say, oh, well, you know, we have objects to encapsulate this. But object, you know, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't actually change anything about this, right? It just puts a blue oval around it. That's all the object does. Nothing about the scenario is, is any different, right? If you actually have multiple threads of control running through an object, that object is really not in control. It's not really, you know, keeping track of everything. All that shared state stuff is still on you. Um, you know, objects are like sort of marionettes where anybody can pull the strings at any time. Right, so that doesn't usually work out that well. So there are a bunch of uh, techniques that have been used to sort of reinvert control, if you will, right? So the control we would have liked to have said is, if there's something interesting happening, do this, do that, see if there's more, something else interesting happening, blah, 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 around and around, around, possibly with different sources of input. We'd love to just go back to writing a blocking program because it looks nice and it's easy to understand and it co-locates all the logic. The problem is we can't effectively do that if we have callback APIs and or this thread thing. So C Sharp and, and F Sharp both had uh, uh, some enhancements made at the language level that attempts to reinvert the control, right? And all they do is take code that looks linear and rewrite it to be callback code, but you don't see that. So what you see looks very straightforward. You say, go do this thing in an async block that takes you know, an arbitrary amount of time, then do this, then do that. And what ends up happening is, is your thread doesn't get blocked there. It looks like it does, but it doesn't. It gets relinquished. And if the thing that you were interested in completes, then you continue. Um, so uh, I saw a talk from the Scala guys who had copied C Sharp async for Scala. Um, and I said, that looks cool. We have macros. We should do that. It's probably a weekend project. And it would have looked something like this, right? So um, you have your original kind of code where you say, an ordinary future, that's a, like a Java future that blocks. Go do something useful. Try to deref the future. At that point, your thread is tied up. right? And then eventually, the future completes. Then you keep going. Um, and the middle code is what you would do if you had callback handlers. You'd say, right, on complete, do something with the result. And that do something with the result is the fragmented code that you know, if it had to share logic with other handlers and or state, it would become messy. Finally, you go back with something uh, that mimics C-sharp async to something where you say, in this a block, you know, treat all co calls to blocking or asynchronous things as if they were uh, blocking, but actually invert control. And you say, do something useful. And then you say, await this future. And what happens is that the, the calling code gets turned into a state machine and parked on a, a callback handler, which will resume that state machine in a thread pool thread whenever the interesting thing happens. And effectively, your thread is back in the pool for, to do something else productive. Um, so that's a, that's a very nice thing. And 
and it has a lot of utility, but it's, it's kind of just a, a subset of the problem that you want to address. Right? It's sort of just sugar, because all that it really addresses is RPC style communication, right? Promises and futures, sort of a single shot relationship between two parts of a system and an architecture, right? Go do this, here's your answer. Or here's a, here's a promise and when it gets fulfilled, there's the one thing that I'll ever send to you is in that promise. Uh, it's just handoff. So it's hard to use to model enduring relationships and it's hard to use for external events. Um, because, you know, again, a future is sort of like, I give you this for an, an answer, but an, an external event is like a stream. It's continuing, con continuing to pass you stuff. So what we want is we want this sugar. Sugar is good. Uh, we just want to put it on a better cake. Um, so uh, again, as I said earlier in the talk, the answer here, the thing that you'd like to have, the programming model that you'd like to have, is queues. Queues fully decouple producers and consumers. Right? If somebody puts something in it, on the end of this conveyor belt, who's going to pick it up? They have no idea. If you're picking stuff off a conveyor belt, who put it on there? You have no idea. Right? I don't know. I don't want to know. I used to say that so often in a course I taught that one of the students made a shirt for me. Right? It's a good thing. From an architectural standpoint, that's a good thing because it means um, you have independent decision making. Uh, so they're also first class. Um, they're enduring, right? You can use them to model enduring relationships. Here's a channel or a, or a queue. Put stuff on it, you know, all day long, all week long. Um, you can make them so that they're independently monitorable. Um, and you can make them so that you can have multiple readers and multiple writers. So what's beautiful about a queue is it does this job and it doesn't do any other job, right? It's not like an actor where the logic of handling is connected to a queue and you get this one thing that's both a mailbox and a handler. Ooh. Because you know, two things, it, it's, it, it, it's not as good as one thing. One thing is better than two things. Uh, so we like this, and in fact, um, the logic and, and uh, way of thinking, this way of thinking about programs is actually old. Um, Tony Hoare wrote this Communicating Sequential Processes paper, which is not exactly like what it's become, but it's the basis for this way of thinking. The idea is simply, you have multiple processes, and I'm not talking about operating system processes here, I'm just talking about some piece of logic that's going to run independently of another piece of logic. And whether that's truly asynchronously, or you're just using um, you know, time slicing cooperative stuff like the J JavaScript engine does, uh, doesn't actually matter, because this is a pattern for organizing your program, not necessarily, uh, it doesn't necessarily dictate a way of realizing it. Um, Channels are first class, at least this is what CSP has become over the years. Channels are first class, so you can pass them around. You can pass them as an argument. You can hand somebody a channel, and they can say, okay, I'll hang on to this and, and either put something on it or read something from it later. Um, by default, the semantics are blocking, and in particular for CSP style channels, um, the baseline semantic is it's a, a completely unbuffered channel. That is to say, it's a synchronization point. It's a, tr it's a handoff point. In other words, one thread is going to come in with something that they're writing, will not go back until another thread comes and uh, consumes it, or vice versa. Um, and when I say thread, I mean thread uh, like this. Um, so you can actually use them for coordination. With that semantic, you can build coordination primitives on top of it. And a lot of the CSP literature is based around doing that. Um, but as soon as you introduce buffering, then you get uh, real asynchrony. Right? Somebody can put something on, it's put in a buffer, they go and proceed, somebody else can take it off. Um, and there's a, a long history of this. Occam was one of uh, the first uh, languages to sort of make this a first class part of how it worked. There's Java CSP, which is a library approach to doing this. And then, of course, Go is the most recent language that sort of took this as a first class. This is how, the, this, is how this kind of programming should work. Um, and uh, I agree with them and their choice. I think it is a good way to do this kind of, kind of thing. So there's a lot of nice things that also have come to grow around this notion of channels. The first is that multiple readers and writers can be supported so that you don't have any binding. You can um, add more readers to support um, uh, work distribution. You can have multiple writers so you can have separate authorship. Writers and readers can come and go. Like no one's sort of bound up to the queue. Um, you can pass the endpoints around. That's part of what I mean by first class. And then the other critical feature, which is quite nice, is there's always a construct called select or alt, um, which is, allows you to wait on more, one or more I.O. operations. So you can, you can select or alt, alternate on more than one channel, like waiting for something to arrive on more than one channel, or waiting for a write to complete and a read, or a read to complete. 
uh, or timeout operations. And um, this is huge, right? Uh, obviously in socket programming, we do this kind of stuff all the time. Um, on the JVM, the queues and the thread stuff doesn't have anything like this on .NET and uh, uh, actually on Windows. They've long had a, a long wait multiple writer. Who remembers what that's called? They have a multi-wait. Um, so a multi-wait is a very nice thing as an organizational construct because you can, again, put a single piece of logic that says, if any one of these things happens, I'm going to proceed and deal with that and then, and then go back. Um, and there's also a set of formalisms and, and algebras around um, uh, doing analysis of programs constructed this way. Uh, so you can prove that they're free of deadlocks and things like that. Um, there's none of that support built into core async at the moment. So there are, there are already implementations on the JVM. Uh, Java CSP would, want, would be one, and Communicating Scala Objects was another. Um, but both of these are tied to actual threads, so they don't overcome some of the thread limitations before. They allow this model of programming, this shape of programming, um, but they, they'll, they would have difficulty using your machine efficiently. So the challenge, the idea behind this library is to try to create a channels, a CSP style channels library for both closure and closure scripts, so something that works in both places where closure runs, um, where you can use the same calls on both platforms, where uh, you could, with similar calls on the JVM, get actual blocking, because sometimes where um, real threads and, and actual blocking are the most efficient thing that you could do. Um, or you can get this macro-generated inversion of control. So it's like what the C-sharp compiler was doing, um, where you have a set of macros in Clojure that will take your code and invert controls to take code that looks like it's saying, read any one of these things and wait until it happens, and turn that into, make me a state machine, and associate it with callback handlers on all these things, and relinquish the thread. And if any of those things happen, one and only one of those things will be seen to have happened by that logic, and the logic will be um, reestablished on a, call, uh, on a uh, thread pool thread, and it will continue to run. So it's beautiful. You write code, it looks like it's blocking, and you get code that's actually um, doing all the callback work for you. So uh, this is a big deal if you can do it, right? Because you can still write traditional threaded apps this way. You can get higher connection counts on your JVM servers if you switch to the inversion of control system. You can even work on invented servers. And then the big, the big kahuna for the um, closure script guys and people in that space is to fix the callback hell problem in the browser. Um, um, there are other ideas for using these kinds of channels on a network. It's difficult actually to convey all the semantics of channels over a network because of the failure modes. Um, and Core Async does not currently contain any network channels. So we're strictly talking about in-process, inter-process communication where the smaller processes are just pieces of logic that have independent lifetimes. So one of the cool things about Core Async in Clojure is that it's just a library. It didn't require any modifications to the language. Right. You can do this with just macros. Um, they take your code, they rewrite your code. That's what macros do. So this is a job for macros. Didn't need to touch closure to do this. Um, what you get are independent threads of activity. We'll call them threads, but uh, the co-alignment with threads is, is weak. And you get channels that behave like queues. And it supports both closure on the JVM and closure script. So it looks like this. You say thread with the body, and that allocates a real thread, and all the blocking calls in that are real blocking calls. Or you say go body, and uh, you get this inversion of control thread that uses a state machine and parking and thread pools to, to do the job. Um, you have channels. Again, they're queue-like. They're multi-reader, multi-writer. They're fundamentally blocking. Um, they're uh, unbuffered by default, or you can have fixed buffers. There's no. Um, indefinitely sized or arbitrary um, buffers in Core Async. We're not going to provide that because it's a recipe for a buggy program. Um, so you may have to tune your program and analyze it and see what's going on. Um, but the, the net result of that is that you can write real programs that have genuine back pressure, uh, which is a great thing as an architectural construct. When you don't have it, you're always struggling um, in its absence. Um, the API is pretty straightforward. You create a channel by calling chan, or you can say chan n, which again gives you a fixed size buffer. Um, or you can create some buffers. And what's nice about buffers, well, I'll talk about that in a second. Or you can create an explicit buffer and pass that to a channel. 
Then there are two fundamental um, constructs, put and take. There will be a parking version and a blocking version. The parking version is one bang. The, parking, uh, the blocking version is two bangs. Uh, I'm not really going to talk too much about the blocking version because that's not supported on JavaScript. So the, the portable code that you can write uses go and the single bang versions of put and take. Um, so you put a, a value on a channel and you take a value off a channel. Uh, you can close a channel. Um, if you are writing a JVM program, you can mix modes. So a single channel can be consumed with both um, truly blocking code um, and this go code. Um, and, and it can also be um, produced with either flavor of code. So you can mix the modes, which is very nice, again, because it, at, at the edge of all these things, you usually have to revert to the code that didn't know about channels. So how do you get there? Um, buffers, by default, are, uh, there, are, there are none, right? So it's unbuffered by default, which is just strictly a rendezvous. Um, a fixed buffer will block when it's full. Um, but the, the other cool thing is that you can really incorporate policy into buffers because you could hand a buffer to uh, a channel. We have a couple of flavors of buffer that implement policies that would be common, right? For instance, a sliding window buffer says um, if the buffer is nominally full, at, when I put something new on it, um, get rid of the, f the oldest thing that's on the front of it, uh, which is quite commonly what you, exactly what you want to do. Of course, the other flip side of that is when it's full, every new thing that comes in, you drop on the floor. So these are the policies you take in a, in a program where you're not going to say, I'll just pretend this unbounded buffer is a good idea and see what happens in production. Um, where you're forced to make decisions, well, there you go. You make the decision and you incorporate it in the policy that's in your buffer. Um, because we think unbounded buffers are bad. Um, then we have this choice construct. Um, we chose alt for that. So this allows you to wait for multiple operations. So you can block on multiple puts and takes. Um, the fundamental construct underneath alt is, is a function called alt, uh, which takes a set of operations represented as data and will wait on any one of those. Um, the critical thing here is that uh, when alt returns, one and only one of the things that you were waiting for has happened. In other words, you've taken one thing off of one uh, channel that you were trying to read from. Or you've succeeded in putting something, but you haven't read anything. So you know exactly one thing. And this is atomic across all participants. Um, if more than one thing is ready, you'll get it a uh, random uh, choice made. Or you can set priority, which would mean if more than one thing is ready, the thing with the highest priority um, is the thing that happens. But one thing happens. And then uh, alt, so alt is a function that implements the work, and alt is just a macro on top of it that allows you to write code that, that, uh, that works like this. So I'm not going to get too much into the code, but this says uh, try to read from C or T, um, call the result val in the channel that actually succeeded ch, and then do something with that in the function foo. The other says wait for read on x, and pass that to a function call, and call it v, and do the work of v. Um, when you pass a pair, uh, you're saying, I want to output a value on a particular channel. And so whatever, whatever operation happened, the thing on the right is the result of the expression. Uh, so these are the operations. This is the binding part. That's what happens if that alternative is chosen. Uh, so like Go, uh, we use channels to represent timeouts. That ends up being very powerful and quite elegant. Uh, you create one by just saying timeout in a certain mil number of milliseconds. And what it does is it just returns a channel that closes after that amount of time. But what's cool about that is it turns a timeout, which is usually an argument to every API call you make, uh, into a first class thing that you can, for instance, reuse across a whole set of calls. In other words, do this for five minutes. You can say, make one timeout five minutes from now and put it in the alt of every operation you do. And after five minutes have come back, that thing will complete. And you hadn't, didn't make a gazillion calls, all of which had five minutes. Well, now it's five minutes less three seconds. I mean, who has done that with timeout code? It's just not fun. So this is quite clean. Um, and you can include the timeout just in an ordinary alt. You try to take from it, and it will return when it closes. And that allows you to share timeouts between operations, which is also powerful, and encapsulate the actual timeout value and the way it's expressed. Um, so if you're familiar with Go, you'll see that this has a lot of similarities to Go and, of course, the other things that have been built with CSP over the years. Um, some of the differences are that all of the operations are expressions, right? This is closure. It's a functional language. We don't do statements. 
so everything is an expression. Um, it's a library. It's not a, it's not a language feature. So it didn't require uh, the language to be built around it. Because there are trade-offs with that. I mean, hopefully Go is going to be able to do what they do quite efficiently because they're oriented around doing it. And in a library, you're going to make some trade-offs. Um, alts, as I said before, I showed you the macro, but it's built on top of an actual function. That's quite powerful. That allows you to write code that arbitrarily at runtime waits on an arbitrary number of things. Like you read a configuration file and it says, go try to read these seven things. If you have a language that's built this into statements, there's no way to make a statement that has an arbitrary number of branches in it. Um, so it's nice to have that be a first class function and we support priority. Um, so at the edges of your program, you're going to be facing callbacks anyway. So is this just a waste of time? Right? It's like, this is great, Rich, but like, I have this pile of things that all pass me futures and listenable futures and promises and, um, or I'm in, JavaScript land and everything is, is a callback. You know, is this, is this a, a lost cause? And the answer is no. It's really easy to bridge to that code because in your handlers, all you need to do is take the thing that they gave you and immediately put it on a channel. Just stick it on a channel. And at that point, you've inverted control. You said, OK, callbacker, we're done. Now it's in the channel system, and everything else is going to be flipped around, um, right side up, if you will. So you, you just put. Um, the values you encounter right into a channel. Um, and those put and take, you'll see this uses the words, they need not be in Go blocks. Right? So that's your entry point to channels from code that's not otherwise in the code that's inverted. Because this code isn't inverting, it's just supplying a value to a channel. Um, similarly, in JavaScript especially, you're going to need to get out of uh, channel land. Right? Because there aren't real threads, and eventually you're going to need somebody to say, okay, well, do this, you know, affect this widget or something. And so you're going to need to revert or reinvert control on the edges of a JavaScript program. And you can use take in a similar way. So take can be executed in code that's not uh, had this inversion of control outside of a Go block in particular. So the combination of these things means that you can. Uh, you can deal with the browser, right? The browser is a place that's all callbacks all the time. That's all they have. It's built, it's oriented around this. Um, and it ends up being the case that, uh, <laughs> you know, friends don't let friends put logic in handlers, right? This is, this is where the hell comes in. This is how you get hell. Uh, so if you do what I just said, um, you can avoid this hell because you don't have any logic in your handlers. And your logic gets, becomes all back in the same place. So when you use closure script and core async, you, you get the separation of logic between events and, uh, and uh, view. And it's a very big deal. I mean, I don't know if anybody's read David Nolan's posts and, and whatnot, but you completely change the kind of code you can write in the browser. You can take things that were nasty, complete messes, even written by expert JavaScript programmers, and turn them into things that are you know, a fifth the size where the, the event handling code is here, and the updating code is there, and the logic is there, and it's, it couldn't be, possibly be cleaner. Uh, so it, it fundamentally changes what you do. And, and, and uh, we were just having a conversation before I, I came up here, and I think the question is, you know, if you had both, would you ever choose callbacks? And the answer is absolutely not. Right? There's all kinds of ways to fix callbacks and make them slightly better. You would never pick that if you had a choice. Um, so the reason why you don't have a choice is because not every language, A, was either oriented towards this or has the ability to morph itself to work this way even sometimes. Um, but when you do, you wouldn't do this. So once you have channels, what does your model look like? Well, the first thing is, is that your logic gets put back together. You have your logic all in one place, no matter how many different kinds of input sources or places you might want to redirect stuff, right? Because this, this is about conveyance. Um, no matter where you're getting stuff from or sending it to, your logic can all be in one place, right? Because you can alternate all of your reads of all your sources together, and you can alternate your writes, or you can alternate the whole set of things that you know, for instance, that you're never doing more than one thing at a time. Maybe you have a very complex state machine. It would be incredibly difficult to coordinate in 19 callback handlers, but if you put them all in the same alt, you know absolutely you're not doing more than one thing at a time. And it's super clean to write. Um, so your code looks like this. So uh, I would like to try to contrast the two things here, because I think uh, you know, you'll see talks about Rx and whatever, and this like, talk about duels, and it's all like, ooh, duels are the same, right? <coughs> they, they look the same. Duels are not the same. Duel means opposite. It has the same shape and the opposite meaning. 
right? The same transformations work on both, but the, the semantics are the opposite. So what happens when we try to contrast um, uh, direct calling, right, which is chains of function calls in the callback model with um, an indirect system that puts channels in, in the middle? And you'll see everything is opposite, right? Your logic in the first case is split up into separate handlers. Your logic is together um, when, you, when you use uh, channels. Right? Your calls are synchronous unless you put in some extra stuff, right? I'm going to call you, or going to call them, or going to call, or going to call, or going to call, or going to call. Bloom, that's all going to happen to them. You don't have any real ability to spread that out unless you superimpose something extra. Whereas with, with channels, it's inherently async. Right? You can choose a policy that synchronizes, or you can choose a policy that doesn't, but function calls, call functions, call functions. You, know, you can't just magically snip that in the middle. Um, you have a one-to-one -one relationship uh, between the providers and the callers. Can, you can make broadcasters, but it's still, I'm calling whoever's going to get called, so like, I'm in charge of doing that. Um, with channels, you can easily get multiple producers and multiple consumers. Right? Um, you have this implicit relationship between a callback handler and the thing it ends up calling. Right? It, you can put all the programming in direction you want, and I encapsulated it in an object and a whatever, but the bottom line is that is going to call you. And here you have an explicit um, separation of, of concerns, which also means that you can do explicit orchestration. Right? I have somebody who's interested in consuming something. I have somebody who's producing something. I have channels. They're all independent, and I can make a third party in charge of doing all that work, whereas with callbacks, it's very difficult to do because you have to get inside the installation of things. Uh, the shared state, as I talked about before, is an internal uh, thing. Uh, whatever shared state there is, of course, there's always some state associated with the channel or a queue, right? What, who, who can get at the head right now and that kind of thing um, is external in any case. It's reified outside, right? That shared state, you've got to come up with your own strategy for making sure you don't, your different handlers don't trounce on each other. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that um, I think the state that you get with callback handlers is inherently a place state, right? So one handler is going to say, there's a new user, let me put him here. Uh, and another handler is going to say, let me go look there and see what was put there by those other handlers. So there's an inherently place-oriented notion to that. Um, the analogy I would make is uh, you, go to the, you, go to, uh, you go to work at your factory, right, and you have your jacket, right? Place is like, I put my coat on this coat hook. And what's your expectation? You can go back later and find your coat on that coat hook. Unless somebody else said, well, we're out of coat hooks, so I'm going to take your coat off and put mine on. And you get these collisions. Whereas with channels, I, you get something that's a subset of state. Right? Yeah, things are changing. It's obvious. right? There's this moving conveyor belt. There's some state here. But it's flow state. Right? If you came into your factory and you took your coat off and you put it on the end of a conveyor belt, what should your expectation be? You're never going to see that code again. Right? You, you, you don't build programs with flow state that expect to go and revisit state. And therefore, they're a lot less complex. Right? There's still state. There's still things in motion here. There's still two machines. Um, but flow machines are less complex than, place, than places. So I think that's a big win. The other thing is when you do callback handlers, that shared state is your problem. Right? Making the channels do the right thing is a library problem. Right? It's just a channel author's problem to make the flow state work. It's not your problem. Um, the logic in a callback handler is passive. Right? When do you get called back? <sighs> Whenever you get called back. You're not in charge. Right? You're, you're passive. When does your logic run? <sighs> Whenever. Maybe I had a conversation with the guy who was going to be calling me, but maybe not. Um, when does your code run in a... In a, a program that consumes channels whenever you want, because you don't have to read those channels. You could be doing something else. You could say, when I'm in this state, I don't look at those channels. Therefore, I don't hear from them. Right? How many people have built you know, large architectures of callbacks and then been like, oh, I wish I could turn off these three when this is happening? That's hard, right? It's very hard. Um, so you, get the, you have the choice right in your logic. Um, the other thing is that this implicit communication is code-driven. Right? And the explicit communication is data driven. The thing that's flowing over these channels is, is data, uh, which means it's straightforward to go and, for instance, put it on a wire. 
or do something, get a real true separation of concerns. Um, we saw this in the design of Pedestal, which was a, 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 a piece of logic for the browser, um, just a library for Clojure that um, in its original incarnation uh, basically takes inputs in, transforms a, uh, a, a, a data model that can detect deltas. So you can efficiently determine when this change came in, these three parts of this data model changed, and therefore these parts of the UI should change. And because that system was architected with queues on both ends of that thing, um, they were able to say, you know what, it would be nice if we could run all this transformation logic in a web worker. And they just took that code and they put it in a web worker. They took these two channels and they marshaled and they marshaled. Right? When you have webs of calls, you can't do that kind of work. Because your, your fundamental communication is not data, it's calling. And you can't just take call, you know, call chains and split them across web workers, right? You can't even call across web workers. So as soon as you can get to data, you should, because you have a lot more flexibility in your system when you do that. So I would say that uh, there's a sense in which this uh, callback thing is, is intimacy, right? Everybody knows by building this whole intimate system with a lot of connectedness. And, and there's a sense in which a channel-driven system is ignorance. Right? I don't know, I don't want to know. I put stuff there and I'm done. I take stuff from there, I don't care where it came from. Right? And we all know that ignorance is bliss, uh, and in this case, uh, intimacy is pain. <laughs> so, not necessarily generally, but certainly in this case, I think it is. Uh, so this is just another taste of what it looks like. Um, this is an example from Go's examples of how you would, for instance, set off a bunch of queries that tried to reach multiple possible sources for each of uh, an image, a uh, web query, and a video query, and returned uh, whichever the first one of those came back with an answer for each of those types, but bounded the entire thing with, for, you know, with 80 millisecond timeout. Um, and that's what it looks like here. It's, ju it's just like the Go code, but it's, um, it's just as expressive, except this is all expressions and not statements. Um, and this is a really powerful and simple way to think about your programs if you're writing concurrent programs. Uh, because the semantics are very straightforward and you can, there's semantics you can get your head around and make decisions based around. It's not like this um, nebulous set of uh, uh, conventions that you're forced into with other solutions. So what do you get when you do this? You get a separation of concerns, uh, a for reals separation of concerns. You end up with logic that's quite coherent and linear. It's co-located. Right? You end up with logic that if it has state, it might be able to just use recursion to maintain that state and not need any mutation constructs or any kind of coordination constructs um, versus the shared state, which would require place-oriented state. You can get coordination out of it if you want. You can run on buffer channels and use them as uh, synchrony points and rendezvous. You can get back pressure, because right, you're going to put in a fixed buffer, which means you can get to a point get the back pressure and then cascade that. So you can build very large systems that have reliable and easy to reason about back pressure um, characteristics. Um, you can make them dynamically configurable, again, because the channels are first class. You can assemble um, uh, a, a network that makes sense given the topology you're encountering at runtime, um, and they're efficient. Uh, so I'd like to just thank the people that helped work on it. Uh, especially Timothy Baldridge did all the icky part of the, the macro that inverts the control, which is quite gross. And if you want to try it, it's here. So the code is here and whatnot. There's a bunch of other things in there now. There are nice constructs for doing merging and mixing and pub sub and kind of higher level things. I mean, certainly I don't anticipate people, I would hope people would not need to work at the bottom in most cases. And I'd also encourage you to make sure that you reserve this code for true conveyance scenarios and not just to write goofy parallelism stuff because uh, it's not actually well suited for that at all. Um, but, but there are a lot of higher level constructs and we hope to have, uh, have more of them, including pedestal based around um, this kind of work. And so that's all I have to say and I can take some questions probably. So the question is uh, how would you, uh, how would you uh, extend this to distributed systems with real, real queues? And uh, the answer is, like I said earlier on the talk, I think that's still somewhat of an open question. You can't necessarily get all the semantics that I just described in, in a distributed queue because some of the failure modes are different. Um, 
On the other hand, what most of the people who have tried doing it have done is just subset the semantics. So you still have these two semantics, and they still work the same way. And I think that's a reasonable approach to take. So for instance, you might have constraints around um, whether or not uh, buffers could be effectively um, blocking. Um, you might always have to install a policy, for instance, like, uh, um, like the sliding window or the dropping buffer. Um, sometimes some of the solutions, like uh, the Java CSP solution, has some networking constructs that require, for instance, the consuming end of a, of a, a channel to, to host it. So in that case, it wouldn't be as first class, right? It wouldn't be a channel like a queue system that's sort of independent of any process that runs. You would have the endpoint connected. I don't love that because I think it starts to smell like actors at that point, and you lose that sort of first classness of the channel is what it is. People come and participate. Uh, but it's something we're actively looking at right now. I do know that I don't think all the semantics can be conveyed. I mean, I, I, th I think that, so the question is, um, have we contrasted between CSP and PyCalculus, which is more recent work and more, uh, more involved? And the answer is definitely not yet. I mean, I'm not sure that PyCalculus has moved to the point where I would consider it sort of closer to something I would use in uh, actual programs yet, as opposed to more of a theoretical underpinning. There's plenty of great ideas there. Uh, but again, you, you, you have this challenge, right? Are you going to write a new language that works that way? Or what can you bring to a, an existing language? So this is particularly interesting because it's a library. Um, Go probably had that question more readily available to them. You know, you, were you writing a new language? Why didn't you use PyCalculus? Um, so my excuse is, uh, of course, it's a library. Um, but I, I do think that there are interesting things there, and, uh, and they, we should look at them. So the, the question is, does, the, does using channels, I'm just going to restate it slightly different, does using channels increase the complexity from a versioning perspective between producers and consumers? And I would say probably not. It probably does the opposite because it's easier to agree on a data representation and, and, and migrate the code than it is to agree on data and code or code and calling signatures and data. I mean, it's always going to be data and, and, and. And so what this does is takes it just down to data. The, the, the contract is data contract. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's more tolerant of versioning independence on both ends, because it's more independent. So the question was, how does this timeout policy work? And uh, so a, a, timeout, a call to timeout creates a channel like any other that you will attempt to read from. And after the timeout has occurred, the, the channel will close, which will close your read to complete. A read on a closed channel returns immediately. So down at the very bottom is the code that actually tries to read. It says alternate, try to read. Um, what's happening is all of these jobs are sent off asynchronously and told to put their results on the same channel C. So this code down here tries to read any of those results and the timeout channel. So this will return when, I, when any of those things produces a result on C at the bottom there. Um, Oh, you can't see my cursor. So I'm wiggling it over the C at the bottom. <laughs> I'm sorry. The alt call at the very bottom says, says, try to read either of these things, C or T. And it will return when either something is available on channel C or T closes, because that's the only thing that's going to happen on a timeout channel. So what's cool about that is that's in the middle of a loop. That loop just keeps going and going. And the single timeout is governing the operation of the entire loop as opposed to having come up with a timeout per invocation of read, for instance. So I, I think this stuff is extremely cool. Everywhere uh, systems that have done this kind of work have um, touched this in order to find an alternative. The code has become dramatically simpler, really dramatically simpler. And the word dramatic should be reserved for this kind of thing. It's dramatic. Uh, so I definitely believe in it. There's all kinds of things that you can do to try to improve performance and things like that. But as an architectural construct, I think it's, it's quite, quite appealing. So I think uh, that, with that, we'll, we have one more question if we got. OK, the question is, has there any work to get them working across processes? It's a little bit like the other question. And um, yeah, people are working on it. I'm mostly concerned that they don't do something that has the same surface and different semantics. So mostly I've just told people, no, 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 no. no. Uh, because that, that, I think, would be a catastrophe. Right? You don't want something that looks the same and behaves differently. Uh, 
Um, so like I said before, I think that there, are, there will be limitations to the semantics you can convey over a wire. I'm definitely interested in having that. In lieu of that, though, there's no problem saying, I'm going to continue to use my favorite queuing system. And on its endpoints, which have got callbacks, I'll do exactly what I advocated before. But then you're combining semantics. You're saying, you're going to convey something with a, a, you know, a third party queue across the wire. And then you're going to turn that into uh, channels for the application code. So you don't necessarily have the channel behavior. For instance, you might not get back pressure across the, the wire that way. But both of these guys will feel as if they're reading a channel that's got a policy on it um, or writing to one. Um, so, so you can combine the two. right? You can use this with all the IO stuff you have already. You can use this with any queues, distributed queues you have already, um, and just turn their API endpoints into reads or writes of channels, and then use channels from there on. Actually making a distributed channel that said, I have the CSP semantics um, may be a research problem, but I don't, I don't think it's completely possible given you know, TCP and other realities we, we, you want to address if you really want it to be something you use in the real world as opposed to a theory. Um, all right, well, thanks. Enjoy your lunch.